Percival Lowell was an American astronomer and perhaps the most famous astronomer of his time. He was born into a wealthy family and built his own observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. Lowell was making very detailed drawings of Mars, and he noticed what he thought were straight lines crisscrossing the planet. Now, he believed these lines were actually canals built by an advanced civilization to channel water from Mars's polar ice caps, a last-ditch effort to survive on a dying planet. As it turned out, though, there were no lines, and therefore no canals, let alone a civilization. But Lowell was also convinced that there were anomalies in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, and he felt that these anomalies could be explained by the presence of a ninth planet X out beyond the orbit of Neptune. By the way, as it turned out, his determination of anomalies in Uranus and Neptune were also incorrect. Still, the search was on, and even though he would not live to find this planet, a 22-year-old farm boy from Kansas named Clyde Tombaugh would fulfill Lowell's final wish. He used another one of Lowell's telescopes. This one fitted with a state-of-the-art camera, and he took images night after night of the sky, and sure enough, he found something. It was very faint, but it was moving with respect to the background stars. This was the discovery of planet Pluto. Planet X was confirmed, and it made headlines all around the world. This is a portion of the front page of the New York Times from March 14th of 1930. And if you look in the lower left, you see that there's a reporting that the planet should be possibly larger than Jupiter. But if it's going to be larger than Jupiter, there should be a disk. In other words, you should be able to see the face of the planet. And there's no such disk. It's just indistinguishable from the background stars. So astronomers quickly revised the initial larger than Jupiter estimate down to maybe about the size of Earth. Still, it would require a satellite orbiting Pluto to help nail down the actual mass. Well, that opportunity would come in 1978 at the U.S. Naval Observatory. So these are high-resolution images, uh, the very best images that could be made of Pluto at the time. Sometimes Pluto appears more or less circular, as you see it on the right, and other times it has a lump. Well, this lump was interpreted to be a moon, Charon. Now, with the moon, a mass could be calculated for Pluto, and it came out to be somewhere around 0.0015, the mass of Earth. So definitely a lot less massive than Earth. Now, this value wasn't correct, but to within a power of 10, it was pretty much spot on. Its actual mass is about twice the mass that was calculated here. So that's really a pretty good result for its time. Now, in the 1990s, the Hubble Space Telescope would produce the clearest, sharpest image of Pluto. Now, this image seems a little bit computer-generated. That's because it is. It's the result of a process called image deconvolution from this. This is the actual Hubble Space Telescope image. It was deconvolved and then mapped onto a sphere to produce the image that we see in front of us here. So this was our very best view of Pluto, and it actually was enough to let astronomers begin to really understand how the surface might be characterized, what it was made of, etc. And our best understanding of Pluto would not come until 2015, when the New Horizons spacecraft, launched from Earth just nine years earlier, would fly past Pluto. Now, in order to get New Horizons to Pluto in such a short amount of time, it had to go very fast. And as a result, the entire flyby lasted only just a few hours. Still, that was enough to take our understanding of Pluto from this to this. What an extraordinarily geologically diverse world Pluto is. In fact, it's the most geologically diverse world next to our own home planet. Okay, so here are some basic stats. Well, its mass is about 0.21% the mass of the Earth, or if you prefer, a little less than 18% the mass of the Moon. Pluto is also very small. It's less than a third the volume of the Moon. And as a result, its density is going to be somewhere a little less than 2 grams per cubic centimeter, which means that Pluto is probably made of just mostly rock and ice. Its surface is 
composed essentially of nitrogen ice, frozen methane, and frozen carbon monoxide. There are also mountains of solid water, and it has a temperature variation between 33 and 55 Kelvin. Uh, that's because uh, Pluto's orbit is rather elliptical, and sometimes it's closer to the sun, while other times it's farther away. Nevertheless, when you look at all these stats, and when you look at the composition of Pluto, what you find is something that has much more in common with the moons of the outer solar system, such as Titan at Saturn or Triton at Neptune. And one of the first things that jumps out at us in the New Horizons image of Pluto is this heart-shaped region. It was named Tombal Regio, of course, and the western lobe of this region is called Sputnik Planum, named after the first spacecraft to orbit Earth. Here's a slightly higher resolution look at the same region, and if we switch to New Horizons high resolution camera, you can start to make out these little polygons in the surface of Sputnik Planum. These are convection cells. Now, we often talk about convection as being associated with internal heat. Well, Pluto doesn't have internal heat, but what this does tell us is that there's less dense stuff, such as nitrogen, that is rising above higher density water and rock deeper inside Pluto's surface. And Sputnik is essentially a glacier. Uh, all of these flows that you see are kind of like nitrogen glaciers that have flowed through these cracks and gullies and flowing out to flood Sputnik Planum with nitrogen ice. Now, Pluto does have an atmosphere, but it's one that is mostly composed of nitrogen, carbon monoxide, and methane. And this atmosphere is not permanent. It actually will freeze out when Pluto gets farther from the sun. If we get a closer look here and we zoom in, we can start to look at the atmosphere and you notice that there are some slight banding features in the atmosphere. If we switch to a processed image, uh, we lose some of the surface detail, but now you can see how the atmosphere stacks itself up. This is not uncommon. This is probably due to uh, photochemical reactions of basically methane haze in the upper atmosphere. And we've seen this elsewhere in our solar system. Uh, particularly at Saturn's largest moon, Titan. We see that same stacked methane haze. And so Titan's hydrocarbon hazes are this blue color. And so is Pluto's. This is an image taken by New Horizons as it flew behind Pluto, turned around, and looked back, allowing the sun to illuminate the atmosphere. Let's take a look at Pluto's largest moon, or more appropriately, its companion, Charon. This is a very enhanced image of Charon so that we can see a lot of its key features in some detail. The first thing we notice is this uh, reddish polar region, which was informally dubbed Mordor. And the red coloring is a result of something called tholins. And tholins are really just organic molecules, uh, largely based on methane and nitrogen. Now, these molecules are actually not believed to be native to Charon, but rather originated on Pluto and were carried over somehow. Crossing through the equator is this massive belt of tectonic, well, maybe fracturing. We're not really sure. It's almost as if something was trying to tear Charon apart. When we look at Pluto and Charon at the same color levels, we see that there is really some dramatic color differences. And it could be that these two worlds formed separately and combined, or it could be that Charon is the result of a collision from Pluto in much the same way that our own moon is the result of a collision with Earth. Pluto and Charon also orbit a common center of mass uh, called a barycenter, and Charon does keep the same face towards Pluto, but Pluto also keeps its same face toward Charon. Pluto and Charon are also surrounded by four additional satellites. There's Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra. So what would form a multiple object system like this? It's very likely that this is the result of a giant impact, or the Big Whack hypothesis. And there are several lines of evidence pointing to this hypothesis. The orbits are all in resonance with each other. So 
Charon, for example, is a 3-1 orbital resonance with Styx, a 4-1 with Nyx, a 5-1 with Kerberos, and a 6-1 with Hydra. Those are some very tightly correlated resonances, and that is exactly the sort of thing you'd expect to see if all these objects formed from the same debris cloud. Charon lacks an atmosphere, despite its large size, and that is something you would also expect to have happen if there were a giant impact. The energy would simply disperse those volatiles, therefore no atmosphere for Charon. And the rest of the moons all share the same basic composition and color as Charon, so this is something else that should be the case if they all formed from the same debris cloud. The orbits are also in essentially the same plane, and this tells us that these objects all had to form together. So none of these could be captured asteroids or something else that came from out of town. If they did, then they should orbit in different inclinations and at different eccentricities. Instead, they're all pretty circular and they're all pretty much in the same plane. All the moons lack the volatiles, just as Charon lacks volatiles, well, so did the other moons. Again, if there were a high energy impact, there should be a lack of volatiles. The moons themselves are also very lumpy, which suggests that they're composed of multiple objects. Uh, so Styx has what looks like maybe two objects kind of smooshed together, same for Kerberos and Hydra, maybe even Nyx as well. It certainly isn't clear from this particular image, but the fact that these objects all seem to have these different lobes is something that we've seen before in comets and other small solar system bodies. So again, if we have a cloud of debris and junk, then these are exactly the sorts of things that we would expect to form as they coalesce back together. And the moons themselves orbit very close to Pluto. There can be a stable orbit as far away as 10 times the distance as Hydra, and yet there's nothing there. New Horizons didn't find anything, so that tells us that all of these moons form together and have a common origin story. But there's one piece of evidence that is missing, and that is Pluto doesn't have any rings. Now that's unexpected if there's a collision, and in fact we've seen rings around outer solar system asteroids like uh, Charliklo. We've also seen them around outer solar system asteroid Chiron, and even dwarf planet Haumea has a ring system. So how come Pluto doesn't have a ring? Well, that's something that is not really known at this time. This is something that astronomers are still pouring through the data and trying to tease out that particular part of the mystery. But still, this is a treasure trove of data that's going to keep astronomers busy for a long time.